Um, all right, so where was I before? I forgot that I wasn't recording. At any rate, so we've got this you know, nice little live server DNS service. Oh, it was optimization. The point is that what he was trying to do was optimize a particular condition. So if you read the article, it basically says, gee, uh, one of the problems is that we, we need to have some sort of a recovery model that doesn't involve replaying the entire log from the beginning. So what they did was they decided they were going to snapshot. But of course, if you take one of the secondaries and start doing a snapshot, it can't, it can't permute its database while it's doing the snapshot. You need a consistent snapshot. You don't need uh, some sort of mix of what was happening yesterday versus what was happening this morning versus what's happening at noon today, because that doesn't give you a consistent snapshot. So the easy way to get a consistent snapshot is to stop one of the secondaries. You got four of them. Stop one of the secondaries, snapshot the database, and then let it catch back up. Okay. But then what happens if something goes wrong with the secondary? Does this start to sound familiar to you? What happens if one of the, you know, the secondary doesn't get its uh, snapshot done in time? So, well, well, we'll give it a finite amount of time and we'll, we'll adjust the amount of time we give it based upon how long it took last time we did it. And so there's some interesting discussion about this, about how do we deal with recovery, which you now know is all of the edge cases that burn you in this stuff. How do we deal with recovery and what do we do to bound our range of uh, tolerable failures? Otherwise, we're going to run into FLP, and we're never going to actually get in anything done. OK, so but what happens if the primary fails when you've got a secondary doing backup, and that secondary gets promoted to primary? Ooh. Yeah? That could happen, right? Because, you know, he's just a secondary. He says, hi, I'm going to stand for a leader. He sends out his ballot. The ballot gets adopted. He now becomes the new leader. But he's behind. And literally, he says, there were 12 steps that were required in order to get into this state where you are hosed. Oh, and by the way, the time to recover that database is measured in many, many, many hours. Turns out that the domain name system is super big. So that's why this is really interesting. He found a bug that would have caused a multi-hour, possibly multi-day outage in a complex failure case. There's some other stuff in there that's really good too. So having set the stage this way, TLA Plus is a great tool. It does take time to master. I know I gave you a one lecture intro to it, and Finn's going to give you the guest lecture today and talk about the work that he's done with TLA Plus and the problems that they've overcome. And in that case, it was based on a problem that occurred in production. It was production, right? The, the, yeah, right. And yeah, could you give me two slide decks? I don't know. I figured you'd do one slide from each one alternating through to make it. Me two. I didn't see. I only saw the two. See, we've got consensus. We have quorum. Yes. Awesome. All right. And so today we have a guest lecture. And I mean, if you really need the other one, it will be in Discord and I can just grab it. But that's uh, so without further ado, which one do you want me to start with? Because I have the turning an incident report into a design issue with TLA plus and uh, compiling distributed systems models into implementations with Pigo. That's turning an incident report into a design? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop. One thing that's really difficult about this is figuring out where the mouse is when it's behind your head. Uh, so that's over there. And everything is reversed. Right, so there we go. We can turn that off and then come back to the middle. And then I will... Uh, Slide show it from beginning. There we go. And now I just have to put the mouse back in the right place. Go. And there you go.
Here's a clicker. Oh, and here. I have a microphone. Thank you. I have two. Sorry for the rustling and clicking sounds, I'm sure. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, you can do that. Anyway, so, um, right. Let's start this game of uh, kind of pseudo slide karaoke, but not really. I gave this talk two weeks ago. Let's see how much I remember. Um, so, uh, I basically am anthologizing some recent material I made for a couple different venues and audiences. So let's see how this goes. This talk was originally given at SRECon 2023, the Americas version, uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was given to an audience of site reliability engineers. So for context, if I seem to be not assuming certain things and assuming other things instead, that's why. It's because you're not site reliability engineers and or I wrote it wrong to begin with. I don't know. It seemed to work okay at the time. Anyway, so the point is, so Tony introduced us by saying you could f predict a bug. This is literally the opposite. Um, it's like you're trying to predict... Okay, it is the opposite, but I'm really struggling to explain how. Because this is also predicting a bug, but it's completely backwards. The bug's already happened, but you're, you're still predicting it. Uh, so, I'm going to skip over this, just credit to those who aren't me. Um, Marcus was my mentor for the work that I did here. Uh, Josh was instrumental in getting a lot of the semantics down. We spent a lot of time arguing over tiny details. And there's a guy called Ben Panel, who also uh, was instrumental in making sure we weren't talking nonsense. So, credit to all these people who are behind these slides and making sure they're actually correct. Oddly enough, I don't actually generally build distributed systems myself, or at least in practice I haven't very much. Most of my time is spent like writing specifications, building compilers and stuff, so other people build the systems for me and hopefully aren't victimized by my horrible tools. Uh, we'll get to the tools. This isn't about the tools yet. Um, so for some basic highlights of what's going to happen, um, in Microsoft Azure, there was a 28-day outage at one point. Now, I don't mean in all of Azure went down for 28 days. That's not what that means. Uh, you'd have noticed, probably. Um, what, actually, what this actually means is a particular request pattern had a terminally high error rate for 28 days while people were sort of scrambling. To, okay, while for some of that time, people were trying to figure out what the heck was going People didn't even know what was going on. And then for some of that time, people were trying to figure out what was going on. And ultimately, the thing came down to reverting a particular commit somewhere in version control for a thing I'm not allowed to tell you the name of. And no one could reproduce the thing. It was basically either we see this in production and we see our metrics move, or we have no clue what the hell is going on. So the idea was normally what you want to do is you go to design your system you write a tla plus model it helps you figure out you know what's going to happen give you your kind of huge 12 step kind of oh how you feel about this thing yes that's totally something you can do but what if you already have your issue but you have no idea how to document or reproduce it you can still model your thing also with tla plus and just because your model predicts something that already happened does not mean it is unimportant. And as a site reliability engineer who doesn't necessarily build systems per se, you maintain them, you construct them out of pre-made parts, and you know you go on, uh, make the server not on fire at 3 a.m., you know that kind of thing. This is something maybe you would care about. Okay. So the point is. What I was proposing to these site reliability engineers is a workflow where beyond the conventional cycle of we do things, we measure what's happened, um, sort of document it in prose with diagrams and graphs of like all the lovely analytics that you would have on a big system like that. Beyond that, you actually want to specify what should have happened Watch the model checker tell you that it could have not happened, counterexample, and 
again, site reliability engineers might know what a model, might not know what a model checker is. I guessed from Tony's intro that you've been given a primer on TLA plus, so you probably do know what a model checker is, right? Okay. Cool. 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 Sounds good. Uh, for the record, uh, you're way ahead of these slides. These slides expect you to have heard about a model checker for all of about 10 seconds. It, that, those were the 10 seconds. So I was going to expand on it if I needed to. These slides were originally benchmarked about half an hour, so I feel no need to rush through them. Um, oh, there a person? Oh, OK. Sorry, uh, I'm used to those things where someone like pops up with a funny picture on Zoom, and uh, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Now, fair enough. Cool. Oh. Sure. We're all, I mean, everyone has an age. Um, yes. Um, anyway. Oh, interesting. I've just realized what happens when you render this to PDF. Uh, yeah, that was supposed to be animated. Oh, well, I'll just pretend it was. Pretend there's like a flashy multi-step animation here. Um, anyway, the point is, I basically told you the story already. Uh, a thing ha some people did a performance optimization. Oh, look, another one. And deployed it, and nothing important happened. And, you know, dot, dot, dot. And then someone started seeing their thing fail really often. Now, the problem basically turned out to be a noise floor issue. One person did a thing that was common for them and rare for the world. And as a result, they could see that this process suddenly started failing, but the actual Azure people who were looking at the world as a whole couldn't see a thing. It was just like hidden in the noise floor. Most people didn't do this thing, but some people did. So they went through, they did all the you know, healthy checking. Are, are our systems broken? Did something happen? Is, is Azure the one doing this? Did it just spontaneously start doing this? And some kind of... Uh, maintenance contracts were invoked, some people looked into it, and they had to ro roll back the change. Also, uh, just for context, this um, the actual document, which I can't show you, had a lot of these words in, except for Frobble. Frobble is a stand-in for the product name. Uh, Microsoft doesn't sell Frobbles. Yeah, indeed, not yet. Maybe they'll see my uh, incredibly influential presentation and they'll decide that this is like the greatest name ever and you'll see a trademark come out and then I'll get takedown for my own slides. Or I, I don't know. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so the point is, it took a while. 28 days is a stupendously long time for a system to be coherently failing while under active maintenance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and sure, they could figure out metrics-wise what they had to do to make the crashy thing not crash, but they couldn't really explain the actual design-level problem. Like, you, I can tell you, oh yeah, so if you switch this around, then the thing stops breaking like this, and we measured it, and that seems to be true. Great, this is all good information. This is not the wrong thing to do. Once you've done that, OK, what do I do about this? What do I tell the devs? Like, what's the issue report here? I don't know. Um, it was kind of unclear, and it just got stuck on this revert, and then people just started redesigning parts of the system on, as part of a separate initiative, and no one was really sure what happened. Also, um, the system was running too fast. And that's what broke it. The optimization literally just made a thing not take long enough for some timeout or something, which is really weird. You want to make the system faster. Uh, this was like part of the um, 
as your VM thing, right? So when you click, I want a new VM, this was supposed to make that experience faster. So this is kind of important, and it's sad that they had to make it slower again just so it didn't go crashy on something. So the point was, understand conceptually what actually happened. And I'm realizing I should probably skip through some of this because I think parts of the Pigo slides are going to be more interesting to this audience. But understand that if you were a site reliability engineer, you needed it sold to you like this because you needed to know kind of that this matters to your real systems. So anyway, I'm just going to jump into the actual descriptions. There's supposed to be a demo for these slides, but sadly I couldn't get the logistics right. In any case, I also have slides summarizing what the demo does. Um, anyway, so the point is, this system has like some kind of a overall diagram. And one of the important players in this, not the system that was broken, was Azure Cosmos DB. Um, so you actually, we got to actually understand this system. And just to give you a basic idea, if you've used like Amazon DynamoDB or like Google Firestore or something, it's, it's like that. It's just the same thing, but on Microsoft. Um, it's a key value store, stores your data, and. Uh huh. I, I see you. But yeah, it's like one of those. And perhaps surprisingly, yes? Oh, never mind. Anyway, perhaps surprisingly, it was working fine. How about that? I'm sure that will be a surprise to some of you. I uh, hear the uh, assignments are interesting. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it, 416 is always hard in that way. Everything breaks, the whole thing. Um, uh huh. Right, speaking of failure, um, pretend that the right hand that the right hand side bit of this slide uncovers to show a more complex system. Again, the animation is just gone. Uh, I forgot PDFs, didn't? I? Oh, damn it. Anyway, so your problem is basically you break down what actually happens, then you do a write to the key value store. And it's fine, it was always fine, and it will continue to be fine by the end of this talk. Then you enqueue your work onto some on a service bus. Uh, this is a real thing you have, like it's, a, it's, a, it's actually an Azure product, but don't worry about it. It's not very important, and I gloss over it immensely. Even in the actual specification in the written TLA+, it's just a sequence. Um, and then... The, there's this worker that picks it up, and it says, all right, let me go get my work metadata so I can do the job. And it gets a 404. That's bad. And it turns out that was the problem, basically. You have this kind of causality error, where you clearly wrote to the database, you go tell someone to do something and read from the database, and it's not there. That's just like kind of, what? Why? And this was happening with a certain statistical probability for a particular user of a system that caused a particular timing situation in a particular workflow that otherwise worked. But yeah, happens at scale too. And basically, to understand contextually, Cosmos DB, I do not need to tell you as a consensus machine. I'll just skip this because you you'll know. What is a little bit interesting is... Cosmos DB has this funny selling point. It has five levels of consistency. And you can configure these globally and per read and write to an extent. Um, and you have this kind of gradient between fast, and I have no idea what this is going to do, and reliable, but it might take two milliseconds instead of one millisecond. I, I don't know how latencies work. But it, it'll take a bit longer. And in the middle, you have this thing called session consistency, which tries to strike a happy medium. 
And it is recommended in the documentation you try to use this. Basically what happens is you have the making sense token. If you give someone else a making sense token, they see what you saw or a continuation of it. If you don't give someone else the making sense token, or if someone else has a different making sense token, you basically see the completely like fast and unreliable version, and there's no expectation that things will stay put, appear, disappear, whatever. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say you get strong consistency, but not strong durability is how I would ca categorize that. Yeah, like, turns out if you kill enough servers, uh, your token expires and your data is gone. Um, I mean, it may be gone. It may also not be gone, but that can happen. And everything I just described is not a bug in Cosmos DB. It is allowed to do that per the semantics we worked out. And that's what we had to do. This is what this talk is really about. Um, it's about kind of a philosophy for describe how we, dis how we made the underlying model and how then we used it to sort of build up to this kind of automated mechanized bug report. And so there's some basic things that I'm just going to go over. You might remember parts of these from TLA Plus depending on how it was presented. But the point here is, for our purpose, we wanted to model Cosmos DB in terms of the key value reads and writes. Cosmos DB, as like DynamoDB, like all those other fancy, shiny things, has lovely, complicated GraphQL APIs that we care not a little bit about. Uh, so we just skip all of that and model key values, reads, and writes. We don't care about individual servers. A client can't see those. It does not matter. What we basically care about is what is a client allowed to see when the system is functioning correctly, albeit potentially in a degraded state. Imagine a data center goes down. Cosmos DB is re resilient to that and has a specified behavior when that happens. You won't need to know whether or not a database is down, a data, a data center is down, but you'll, you'll basically know that it may spontaneously do a slightly odd thing as a result that is still within what you should have coded for, we hope. And of course, another animation missing, but basically, if you're a site reliability engineer, don't actually bother doing this yourself. It took us about three months, and that's quite reasonable for a modeling effort, honestly, for a system of this scale. But if you're a site reliability engineer, you don't have time to do any of that, and we did it for you. So basically, we took that entire table and mapped out every single behavior under every single degraded condition that we could possibly think to summarize. We may have missed one, but we caught so many interesting things that were previously completely undocumented that we're calling it a win anyway. And you can go find our uh, paper on that at XC 2023. I still have to do that presentation. I will skip the demo, but I will show basically this idea. I think you'll remember this from TLA Plus, so I'll just skip through it pretty fast. It's about this sort of branching possibilities. Because remember, SREs don't know what model checking is, so I have to actually spell this out. Well, they might not know. Some of them do, I'm sure. Some of them did, actually. We talked to them at dinner. Um, and it's basically, you have these cases of, it's allowed to do X, Y, and Z, and you can describe these rules and say, OK, will it always do this? Maybe, maybe not. And essentially, what we did for the demo was, OK, it should all never get a 404, under a, correcting, under, under a correctly functioning system that doesn't uh, have token expiry. Because token expiry is out of scope. Like, that might still happen. But we don't want to talk about that, because this wasn't the problem. The problem, essentially, that I could show in the complete publicly available spec was that they weren't sharing session tokens. They just didn't do it. Um, and it was hidden behind, like, multiple layers of API calls and like thousands of lines of code and some mess or other. 
But essentially, that's what it boils down to. And you can take a TLA plus model, and even with like a failing model check, you can basically explain this at a high level is what the devs might want to pay attention to if they want to remove a design level contributing factor to this incident. And that was the selling point. Also, this is a kind of thing you can draw uh, using the TLA plus model checker, the emits dot files. And so basically, the corrected design is send the token. You just put the token, and then the thing reads with the token, and it sees the causality. Not surprising, but if you need to demonstrate something, sometimes people believe you more if it's a runnable artifact. Also, it makes more sense because you can actually inspect it and stuff rather than trust that there isn't a plot hole in the middle of the story. And essentially, the issue comes down to that bug was always there, actually. Not only was it not fixed by the revert, it was just changed its probability. So previously, it was so improbable that sometimes you'd hit make a new VM, and it would just grind and crunch and get confused. You've seen this. I, I've worked with Azure for three months or something, and I started seeing that. So it's totally a real thing. And I'm sure there are other bugs in the world that cause this. But this is one of them. And we're able to point out how it causally occurred without having to make it measurable. Because it was not measurable when it originally existed. It just became measurable when someone made a performance optimization. It is sad because we don't want to punish making the make new VM faster. And that was all I had for these slides. And I can switch over to a completely different angle on TLA+. If we actually have a second for any questions, could you please actually get the other slide deck? I'm I'm much more familiar with it, and it's much more concise. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, it's just a third one that's just like three messages up. Cool. Yeah, any questions so far? Go for it. Uh, I mean, you can use it to try and verify existing systems. That's kind of an analysis task in and of itself. But by the time the, the, th the problem is done and gone, and you have like an incident report with like five pages and graphs and stuff, normally people don't really try that. Because it's like, oh, it's explained already. Well, yes, but the explanation isn't very specific in a certain kind of way that the TLA plus part can contribute. So that's that's the angle. Yes, people do, of course, use it for analyzing existing systems to varying degrees. Essentially, yes. We did generally model the Cosmos DB thing. That was not targeted. However, we were able to very specifically like throw out a bunch of like random junk that was unnecessary in our modeling of the incident itself. It was like 20 lines of pluscal, which is the higher level language on top of TLA plus for pseudocode stuff. And that made it very simple to see what we needed to do because we just took the flowchart basically. I can't remember which way around we did it, but essentially the flowchart just goes straight into exactly what the set of processes we modeled does. Like dispatcher, worker, Cosmos DB is there. The exact arrows I showed, that is exactly what it did and exactly what it showed. I may have written the code first, but in any case, it comes down to that. Great. Cool. The sparkling pig is here. Um, right. OK. Please don't. Uh, Yes. Um, so just to explain why the sparkling pig is a thing, um, just say pigo to yourself a few times, and then wake up at 2 AM and open Inkscape, and something like this might happen. Um, but yes, it more or less became pigo's brand identity because we didn't have a better idea. Um, anyway, so this is what was originally a 12-minute presentation. 
which I will expand on and switch into the other slides as needed. But I think this is a good place to start for the other project I was going to say. So the first project is a kind of more of a lightweight thing. Technically, that is taking one day of an internship and blowing it up into a 30-minute talk. Now, this is taking five years of research work and crushing it down into 12 minutes. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, and I gave this talk last Wednesday, so let's see how much I remember. Basically, um, Pigo is in a different space. So you have, how do you, how do you verify like a real system? Like you can talk about design issues, you can talk about you know, approximations of real systems, but how do you deal with a case where you want to actually write the code, roughly speaking, of how your system works, and actually get a runnable system out of the thing you wrote for model checking. That's what Pigo is basically supposed to do. It, give, it lets you write a specification that is de facto more or less executable. There are asterisks to this. But uh, let's, let's get into it. To start with, you'll know this. I, I, I'm not going to bother. Um, this is the actually relevant part. Um, so, actually, even this is probably a bit unnecessary given what we've already talked about. You have, like, you know what? Yeah, this is already done. Basically, the protocols can, ha can be specified and it can. Sorry, that isn't what the slide says. Protocol descriptions, when you write them like in Englishy stuff, like as RFCs, it can be quite unclear what they do, and so formal specifications are helpful. I think we've gone over that. So just to give you some context, this might be a little fun just because you can go look these up. Um, these are all background slides, right? So we're getting to the system, don't worry. The system isn't like, oh, this bit's not interesting. No, no, it's in there. Um, so you can use proof assistants. These are really fun. Uh, they're just really hard to use and require essentially a graduate degree. I say require, obviously the piece of paper doesn't give you the magical power to use them, but it takes, yes, I, I needed a, about a month of tutoring before I could get anywhere reasonable with it, uh, with one of these. I used the one underlying the leftmost item, um, but they're all quite interesting. Essentially, these are the equivalent of a pocket calculator for math, for logic and math. Uh, you can like do in implications. You can do various like everything you've seen in like 121, 221, that kind of thing. You can just have an automated checker do this. And actually, some universities use them uh, to make gradable uh, assign auto gradable sorry, mathematics assignments. So you actually do your math homework, and you write it as a program, essentially. If the program compiles, you're good. Doesn't that sound insane? Um, like, the, the compilation process is so precise, and the types are so specific, that by the time the thing type checks, you're actually, you've achieved something significant. Um, so that can be pretty neat. Model checking, we've already talked about this. Um, model checking implementations is a secondary thing. If you instrument your, your implementation, like your threading system, your runtime, you can basically have a, have a tool that sits on top of your system under test. Don't do this in production. Um, and it watches, OK, so there's been a network send from A to B. Now, it could come through immediately. I could also hold on to it and let one of the systems go for a bit. And like it controls all the system schedulers, and it controls all the communication. And basically, you can use this to extract unusual behaviors from your implementation. This is a very complex thing um, computationally, because your implementation is big, and it does a lot of stuff. And most of it is irrelevant, but it has to be explored to some extent anyway even if you make some theoretical simplifications. 
it is very interesting, and uh, there's actually some real tools that exist. Like if you're going to write your system in C sharp, there's a thing called Coyote, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, and I'm sure there are many, many others. Some of these are kind of old, but there's a lot of ways to do this, and it can work on practical systems and actually get you results. So just because I say this isn't like the greatest thing, there's no silver bullet. Go try it if you like. Um, and as we know, this is the bit that I don't need to go over too much. PLA Plus allows you for this allows this weird kind of intermediate thing where you model check at the design level. And unlike the implementation model checkers and some other model checkers that will basically just fiddle your system, like shake it a lot to see what happens, uh, exhaustive model checking is kind of breadth first search up to a bound, and it can more consistently find certain things. Ah, oh cool, nice. Yeah, so there you go. I had a suspicion it was that. Uh, Tony had mentioned it to me before, but I couldn't quite remember. So, thanks for adding. <laughs> so basically the issue that I'm getting to is you can have your design, you can have an implementation, and it's not super clear what the link is. It's quite possible, for example, to have an assumption in your design that is physically impossible. You, the, the verifier, whatever you do, even like the really hardcore math level verifiers will be like, all right, well, assuming this, your thing is fine, have fun. And then you actually implement it and something happens and you don't notice that part is impossible. Like maybe you're assuming something you don't need to code, but you think that's what the environment does. Like maybe your network one that I have actually seen in the wild, if you will, the wild of verified distributed systems, which is quite niche, but I've had to explore a fair amount of it to uh, justify that our tool, where our tool is relative to the other tools. Um, the assumption that you can send unbounded length UDP packets. Uh, yeah, it's like, you don't want to think about length bounds when you're doing like your distributed systems proof. But it turns out that if you don't, then you don't deal with chunking your packets properly. And one of the systems, uh, the one called Verdi actually, the one on the top left on the previous slide, um, it can't send, if it's, these are all key, va these are all things that generate key value stores or have been used to generate key value stores because they're ubiquitous in terms of you know, it's a complicated thing that's easy to understand in terms of like what it's supposed to do, even though how to do it is quite hard. Um, and so what Verdi, Verdi's system does, which is called Vardi, um, you would give it like a benchmarking workload and it would have some pretty big keys and values and you'd hit it for like a second and it would end up with an update that it tries to send to peers According to the RAF protocol, it's very similar to what you'll have been doing with multi pack sauce or pack sauce or whichever one. Okay, all right. But did they implement it? Oh. Right. It's very, very, very similar, yeah. The so minor sort of contextual assumptions are different. Really? Because oh, there's the whole thing of... Right, even like the minor difference of uh, Raft can't progress without a leader, whereas the other ones technically can. Right, Raft does. Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Right. Mm -hmm. Why do we use that? Pattern hours. Actually, 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. I guess that's the thing. I've implemented Raft, but not Paxos. And even then, mostly other people invented, implemented Raft for me. So I'm not as comfortable with these edge cases as you all have been, who've actually literally had to suffer through their specifics. OK, continuing to suffer through the specifics. But you get the picture. That's interesting. Thanks for clarifying. I wasn't aware of that, because I've never actually properly dealt with multi paxos only single paxos which has apparent difference in the sense I described. In any case, it doesn't actually matter the point, or at least not for the general point, which is there's all these kind of funny details. Uh, oh, right, and I was talking about that Vardy thing, which is essentially just this kind of minor issue. You could probably fix it just by editing the specification in a certain way. but you also can fix it by using smaller keys and values simply because it doesn't hit the edge case. We did that for benchmarking purposes. It doesn't turn out to make much of a difference. Um, anyway, the point is, weird things happen, and you get this funny gap. So what we want to do is we want to try to bridge that gap as well as we can. And that's basically the idea of Pico. You have your model, you compile it into an implementation, and we made a modeling language. It's called MPCAL. Um, I'll show you a quick view of it in, uh, I think, like one slide or something. And the idea is, as long as you're OK learning a DSL type thing, uh, your verification effort isn't too bad. Um, and you can deal with, yes? OK, my bad. I keep forgetting some people don't know what the term DSL is. So it's not an internet connection. It's um, a domain-specific language. So arguably, Pigo is both both is and is not. Uh, MPGAL both is and is not a domain-specific language. It's a language, definitely that. And it is somewhat tailored to building distributed systems in the sense that it is somewhat specific. Which distributed systems, how they work exactly, what their internal structure is, not specific. Optimized for I.O. type workloads? Absolutely. Uh, its single-threaded performance has never really been a focus. We have not even tried to optimize it, so I do not suspect it is very good. So the point is then, you have this thing. You can reason somewhat abstractly, like when doing TLA plus design stuff, but you can actually get an implementation out of it that is automatically generated from your model that's verified. This is not a perfect process, and I'll get into that, but. That's the idea. And as a result, you get this flowchart, which uh, gives you ego in two places. You have the modular plus cal, MP cal. And Pigo can get you to an implementation, which is in Go in this case. The Go part is not essential. Um, actually, I have aspirations to re retarget it to Rust, because uh, Rust's inliner is amazing, and it's reasonably safe about like funny structural stuff. Um, so I can write a fancier output code while not trying very hard. So that, that would be very nice for me. Um, and then you configure that Go program, and you deploy it, and in principle, it actually works. Also, uh, Pigo will take MPCAL and generate a TLA plus verification 
owed obligations for it. And that's, that's the deal, basically. Now, so that you can see a bit of MPCAL in action, if you will, um, the idea is it looks like this sort of melted version of TLA plus with extra constructs on top of it. So it has state variables that you can have. You can have a process, which is literally either a thread, an operating system process. It doesn't really matter what it is in practice. Uh, in our runtime, we allow you to select any of these. Um, and basically, that becomes an instance of a thing with dependencies that have semantics. So that's the top left diagram. The bottom left is, this is how you actually write code in MPCAL. You have this thing called an archetype, which is not a process exactly. It's, a, it's like a function, and it basically compiles to more or less um, a thread or a process or something. It is parameterized using dependencies. So we see this network thing. What this means is we have an abstract view of the network. It's described like kind of a TCP channel thing, which is the whole left pane of this slide. Um, and there you can say what happens when you read from it or you write to it. And you'll see some of these things that look a bit like TLA+, and some of these things that look like a text templating language. This is not text templating. We actually do understand the semantics, and we can tell you if you do something weird. Um, but essentially, this allows you to say, uh, to add conditions and things to reads and writes without messing up your code. Your problem is the archetype content gets compiled. If you model something like packet loss and you just put it in the archetype, if you compile your system, what packet loss would be in this is basically you say either you send it or you just send the message or you just, I don't know, don't send it. And if you compile that, you will end up with a system that flips a coin. It's like, do I send it? Do I send it not? Do I send it? Um, that's really not what you want. You want it to try its best, and maybe it won't actually work. So what you do is you take the maybe, maybe not, and like pull it out of the archetype where it gets compiled and put it in the contextual information where it doesn't get compiled and it doesn't mess up your system. So kind of that's the whole point of modular pluscal. That's why we designed it. It's basically like the pluscal pseudocode on top of TLA+, but with constructs to enable what I just said. <clears throat> okay. um, so as a quick cheat sheet in one slide, which normally I really skim over, but just so that you know, um, so it's an imperative, multi-process, multi-threaded language. Uh, the values are what you remember them to be from the previous presentation. You've got primitives, sets, key value mappings. It's surprisingly similar to like a JSON-like thing. That, that's the vibe. It's not JSON, but that's the idea. <laughs> it has some funny statements that it supports. Um, it has an await statement, which is not like async await from languages you might know. Instead, you basically give it a predicate and it decides whether execution continues or whether just no. So for example, like you, you have a certain segment of code, and, you, and in the middle of it, you have like await x less than 2. If x is 5, this segment just doesn't happen, like even the line before it. So it's kind of weird to implement, but it's very powerful for modeling, because you could just say, just assume this is not a thing. And it just won't be. And you have to actually have this kind of funny reversion assert actually work at runtime. Similar with either. Remember the packet drop thing? Either it does or it doesn't. Well, that's a real thing you can just write at any point in your code. This is great for modeling, and sometimes you need it for things like well, either I receive from this, or I receive from this, or I receive from this. Any one of these might happen, and you might want to decide based on I.O. availability which ones you actually do. So this is totally a real idiom you actually use when writing systems in MPCAL. We'll get to why those are hard to implement and what we have to do about them. Um, so the verification, uh, it's got the temporal logic thing. You'll know what that bit is. And the point is, 
uh, you have this dependency injection thing, where, as I described in the previous slide, you can take dependencies, say how they're supposed to work, and add them in. And at the same time, at runtime, you can also do the same thing. Your generated code will have holes in it for those dependencies, and you dependency inject them. So it's pretty standard in that sense. So here are some things that we had to deal with. And depending on time and questions, uh, I have slides that actually describe these. That's the other slide deck. Um, but for now, I'll just go over them in principle with a little bit more flavor than I would normally. So non-determinism is one of those things. Uh, basically, our generated code has to use this kind of transaction-like retry system to get the either or and await. For example, if you have an either or with an await in it, like, oh, not that one, try the other one. And it has to do that while undoing any of the side effects of the other branch and stuff like that. There are some smart ways to compile certain special cases, but we haven't looked at those yet. I aspire to eventually, maybe. But also, you need to have efficient I.O. And that was the thing we really spent a lot of time on in terms of dealing with like networks, disks, timers, all this stuff you'll approximate in model land and how to replace those in ways that are maybe not quite what the model says, not exactly, but a sufficient subset of what the model says that nothing breaks. And in such a way that you can actually pass in a working thing that is reasonably efficient to your implementation so it actually runs properly. And that's how we got something that's only 10 times worse than a production system. It's also like three times better than, or no, no, sorry, three times is the wrong number. It's also notably better than all other verified distributed systems. So before you get your hopes up and try to make like a new startup that is perfect in, it, in how its systems work, do consider that I just spoiled a future slide, but do consider that our performance is good for the space, not in general. And that's an ongoing problem, because as you try to talk about all these generalizations and simplifications to actually sort of map them to a real system, you have to kind of elaborate a lot of stuff. And automatically elaborating that leaves as a certain overhead cost, more or less. Like, there are ways to re reduce the overhead cost. But as it is now, that's what it does. Um, and so we have this whole API at the runtime level where you can plug in things with like different kinds of retry support and stuff like that. Also, uh, and here's actually an utterly standard thing that we did, is we used a thing called hash array mapped tries, which I won't explain. But if you want to look them up, they're a fun functional programming construct, which basically means you can take what is supposed to be like an immu immutable value, and like, if you have an immutable dictionary, normally you have to like copy the thing to make a new version of it with like a change or something. But these hash array mapped tries are data structures where you only have to copy a tiny little bit of it and you share pointers to the rest. So it's actually O of 1 updates while copying, which is neat. And of course, the O1 hides the fact that it's like 10 times slower than an imperative, than an immutable map. But it's still O of 1, and it's pretty darn good for the space of immutable data structures. So this is quite standard. It's used in most functional programming standard libraries, including in the implementation of, in the implementation language of the compiler, which is Scala. The map in Scala is one of these, just straight up. So having digressed a little bit into some of these details, um, We've got an implementation. It's on GitHub. Um, I think we link it in one of the slides anyhow. Um, and yeah, basically the implementation has a bunch of stuff for like reusable libraries for various utilities. And we built a bunch of systems. And the one in the slides is the Raft Key Value Store. Um, and there are actually a few others. There's like a demo lock service. There's a, I forgot the name, um, primary backup key value store. And there's some kind of CRDT type experiments. 
For the purposes of this, though, we actually built the thing. I'm sure you'll recognize parts of this diagram. It's kind of, you know, yes? Oh, damn, sorry, I forgot that was not a common term. Okay. Right, yes, good, thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry, my bad. I, I hear the term so often, it just sort of became a word for me. Um, right, so conflict-free replicated... I forgot what it stands for. Okay, let me just explain what it is, because that's what matters. Sorry? Oh, I did get it right. Cool, thank you. Sorry, I wasn't sure of myself. Um, so a conflict-free conflict -free repl replicated data type is basically the idea that um, if you want to exchange data across a system where things might get delayed, things might happen asynchronously in complicated patterns, if you want a data type that you can just sort of take a copy of, do stuff to it, and send back the result, and have multiple different nodes do this concurrently, and when something receives two different copies that are diff uh, of like different versions of this thing, instead of saying, oh no, and like having a problem, you just take them and just put them together and it just works. There's a variety of data structures where this can happen, and this is basically the key property. Can you merge them in a way that is commutative and associative and so forth, so it doesn't matter what order you got them in, you get a sane result in any case. Just as a basic example, a set, an add-only set is a perfect example of this. Like, you take the set, you add A to it, someone else takes a set, add B to it, you both send it over, oh look, two uh, set union. And it doesn't matter who did what, set union just gives you an answer that is sane and completely workable. And there's other, there's a bunch of other data structures like that. I think we used a map structure in the one I re referenced there. But uh, there, there's all sorts of fun. You can even do it with, like counters. If it's an increment only counter, for example, again, plus suddenly starts actually behaving like a, like a universal merge function. Um, yeah, so that's basically what they are. Um, you'll see them around. Uh, I think SoundCloud uses some kind of data structure like that. I think Google Docs uses a, ver a more advanced variant of the type of structure to deal at least halfway sanely with different people typing on the same document at the same time uh, while giving each per... Because that's the thing. Normally, if you try to build consensus on a value that doesn't support this, you have to like make someone wait. But instead, if you... If you want to allow both system, like n diff as many systems as you want to concurrently actually work at maximum speed with no like funny latency for the humans, uh, you have them all work concurrently all over each other, and just have a system a data structure that's resilient to that, and that's kind of the deal. So yeah, I think that's all of it. Thanks for the pointer there. And yeah, for our evaluation, uh, we built a Raft-based key value store. Well, I say we. What I mean to say is uh, my co-student, uh, Cheyenne, suffered through building the system, and I built the compiler and fielded uh, GitHub issues, um, which were also challenging in their own way. But um, it's that funny thing, right? You haven't, no, no one person on our project has done everything. So. Basically, what the system was, it took about 25 person days to write. Um, the thing is about 750 lines of code in MPCAL. And it has a scary but not actually scary number, which is um, it has a thousand lines of GLU and IO code that was handwritten around it. Now, you might be thinking, that's more lines of code than the system. What are you on about? And the answer is, most of this is reusable library code. We are counting, essentially, the language's standard library in this. So it's more like another 100 or 150, that kind of ballpark. 
Uh, of course, there is a lot of care that is required because basically what you're doing is you're, pa is you're passing in dependencies that should act like what was modeled. Even Pigo can still be victim of, whoops, we forgot about the size of the packet. Now, of course, in Pigo, what you can do, rather than just having this kind of vague relationship between the model and the implementation, we actually have a complete API where you can go in and say, oh, we messed up that bit. All right, let me fix that. And you're you may or may not even need to edit the model. You might just need to improve the dependencies. So there is a benefit here, but there is still the open problem. Sorry, I bumped the mic. Uh, there is still the open problem of how do you more generally deal with these assumptions? And uh, we've got some future work potentially on that. So if you're looking for a career in grad school, do consider that there are a lot of open questions and things. And uh, feel free to reach out at some point. I know most of you are probably graduating to go to like nice industry jobs or whatever, and that's great. But if you feel, OK, OK, fine. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I'm sure only slightly nervous laughter, but still, you know, if you are somehow still around either because you want to be or because you have to be or whatever, it's an option. Uh, won't say no to... There are, there are many talented grad, uh, undergraduate students who have also contributed to Pigo over the years. For example, one right now is rewriting uh, the compiler entirely to, as an experiment for like one of our follow-up projects. And they're just concurrently taking 4.11 and doing their best. And it's really good. Anyway, so shout out to Kim. Um, anyway, that was uh, quite a lot to say for one bullet point. But yeah, basically, anecdotally, and this is, take this with a grain of salt because we're comparing different graduate students across the world here, which is really unscientific. But uh, we could build our system three times faster than the other faster system, which is like insanely faster than everything else also. So that's nice. That's optimistic. Yes. You might be surprised. You caught the one case where we actually do the exact same thing as your assignment. Uh, we try probably a bit harder for some other things, like we have all the persistent logging and stuff like that. But yeah, we actually only do fail stop. I think. Yeah, no, we, we, de we, we only do fail stop. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh. Well. Um. Technically, I started on this. Um. When in like 2017. So whatever the math makes that out to be. Yeah. Sure. I was gonna say five. So. Uh, 28, um, it's 27, so it's somewhere around the same time. It's when I started working with Ivan, I was in my fourth year, and I took 416, and I was doing the directed studies project at the same time, and it's all kind of bundled together, so. It... Oh, come on, I, I do remember it, just because we didn't actually implement multi sauce, so I didn't know that part. Doesn't mean I don't remember what I do remember from it, which then misled me to make that statement before. Eh, I can. How do we use Mm-hmm. How do we use Thank you. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All in the mm-hmm. Hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Better do a good job of it. Better run it whenever you Oh, oh God! <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, literal uh, literal interpretations are always a thing to consider. Yes. Okay, uh, so the answer is a subtle one. Um, the Generally speaking, it's decently applicable. Um, honestly, there's also quite a few pain points to it. And lastly, uh, there's lang programming languages are a huge cultural meh. Uh, I would know. I deal with them way too much. It's basically, Ivan likes Go... Um, we had Go as like our starting point. It wasn't worth changing. I was too busy changing other things. Now that we've actually built the thing and we've found some of the real like subtle pain points, it's actually quite e quite possible to argue. Oh, let's try porting the thing to Rust. That'll be that'll be an actual net win. But it's basically beyond that. It's a cultural factor and some convenience. Like it's not. It's actually got quite a nice runtime. It's just I'm just. Sad about its optimizer. Actually, yeah? I had a teacher. Okay. Not because of us. I mean, uh, I think it goes. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, let's just generate all of the code automatically. So the actual implementation. Forty-six 
you have to go look up all the decorators <laughs> and figure out what they actually figured out. Oh. All you right. Don't take five minutes. Struggling with sharp knives. What can I say? Yes, I have lots of scars. But I don't. Nothing. Actually, I would say about 20 to 30 years of architecture innovation. No, no actually, that's the really bad thing. Running a 1970s primary. And its competitors in the 1980s architectural. That's it. And those fair are both older than everyone else in. Fair, fair. I guess I would simply say they at least pretend to be those things, and some things have changed over time in terms of how they behave. But I agree, like the fundamental like instruction set you get, yes, of course that's. Yeah. And, well, in fact, the best part about it is the fundamental instruction set that we. Binary compatible mm -hmm. Every single processor. Mm -hmm. Binary compatible. Right. Actual processor. You go buy an Intel processor. Uh -huh. You get an arm on it. Yeah, because that's the only other alternative. Which... So, somewhere along the way, people, so we need architecture. Right. And actually, old instruction, 1974, current underlying rich architecture process. Not explicitly. Don't explain this in the documentation. Mm -hmm. but it's important. Go look at how self metal modified. Go look at how the L1 A, L1 I cap talks about that's we're gonna take all those high level, high level operations different angles on the fly. Modify the code and have to invalidate the task because it's directly mapping from the memory where the code originally was to a uh, micro. Yeah, it's actually not oh. changed at all. Right. Or you can argue that what you were just saying is what I was referencing, but yes. One, one way. Yes. Yeah, this is the same as it was yesterday. We actually do this all the time. In fact, mm -hmm. even the thing we're talking about where we deploy things. Actually, we're all kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. Live system. Right. Sorry, right, editing. Okay. Yeah. So I have, fortunately, I guess uh, I don't need the third slide deck. Uh, don't worry. It's just about the same system. You're not missing anything. Uh, I don't have very much else left to say. Uh, the one follow-on is if you're traumatized by having all this, all these failure issues with distributed systems. Uh, you can instead come and build compilers where your problem is simply a bunch of trees and humans instead. It's the same issue. It's just transposed. Anyway, um, so I've already summarized this slide pretty much. Um, we have the 10x difference. We still actually do pretty well for on the YCSB Yahoo um, database benchmark. It just throws a bunch of like reads and writes and stuff in various distributions. Um, and you can see that for a big aggregation of a bunch of those results, we're doing all right. Um, we actually made a second version with a modularization of our system, so split into two communicating parts. Uh, because you have a big model, model checking it takes exponentially longer relative to two smaller models. We experimented. It has overheads. We didn't try as hard optimizing it, but it's still OK. Um, failures. Yes, fail stop. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, we also won the Distinguished Artifact Award because of my Scala scripting, so thank you, organizers. Um, thank you. And, uh, yeah, that's...
pretty much it. I think I've said most of what there is to say that would make any sense in a lecture. Uh, I've also noticed we're basically on time, so uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the discussions. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we are done.